from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 94 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always by James Cratch and Dan Duggan. They cover the Giants for NJ Advanced Media, and we're about to hit that point of the summer where all you do is look forward to football coming back. It's kind of a, a downtime for the Giants and every team around the NFL, but that means we have a lot to talk about because the full offseason program is done. Mini camp is over, so a lot of takeaways from the guys. Roster projections, we'll talk some Odell, uh, and maybe a little word association at the end with some of the big names as we look forward the 2017 season. James, we'll start with you. It's over. The off season is, is officially in the books. And, you know, now it's all about looking forward to the season and training camp and, and the next season of Giants football. Yeah, I mean, it's this is really like the next couple, six weeks or five weeks or however you want to count it up is really the only dead period in the NFL calendar. I mean, nothing really happens here at all. And then before you know it, it's, it's late July and, and the teams are reporting to training camp and then it's kind of full speed ahead you know so the Giants obviously they they exit the offseason program after a lot of off the field headlines with uh with Odell uh they exit everybody was there for the most part uh this past week and uh they've got a lot of optimism behind them as as they kind of head into the summer and prepare to training camp and I think the big question is going to be you know everyone thinks this team is going to be really good but you know how good will they actually be once the pads come on and once we progress further into the summer and then to get to the fall obviously so, Dan, what's the big takeaway? Like, how do you walk away from this offseason with the Giants? Kind of, we could put a bow on it because uh, there's been a lot of layers from free agency to the draft and now, you know, the, the camps from OTAs to minicamp. Uh, we, we have the end of this offseason program in, in totality. Good offseason for the Giants here? Yeah, I mean, I think the first point out of the gate you kind of have to make is no serious injuries, which is obviously one of those things where when they don't happen, you don't talk about them. But, if you know, if a big time player went down with a torn ACL or something, uh, it would obviously be a huge storyline. So I really can't overlook that, that they came out of this with, uh, you know, Ben Mackett, whose kind of word of the spring was sore, which pretty much described, you know, every injury under the sun, apparently. But uh, sore is obviously better than, you know, torn ACL and, uh, you know, torn Achilles tendon. So they didn't have anything catastrophic. I mean, obviously... Uh, we don't know for, for sure, you know, the Eli Apple's hamstring injury is going to linger or if Daniel Tam- uh, Thompson's foot injury is, is truly in the past. But the fact that these guys were out in the field and, and you know, n- no one ever seemed to really raise any, uh, you know, alarms about their injuries, uh, I think you can feel pretty comfortable that they're going to go into training camp uh, in good shape, which, again, is pretty much the number one priority, I feel like, in these offseason workouts. Um, beyond that, as far as something a little more of what we did see, uh, I think the offense – uh, you know, has a chance to uh, actually be what we all thought it would be last year. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the pieces they've added. I mean, the upgrade from Victor Cruz to Brandon Marshall really can't be overstated. We've, we've kind of been banging that drum all offseason. But seeing him on the field, he's just so much more of a weapon, um, you know, that fits into what this offense uh, kind of needs. I think the best play of the spring maybe was you know, he made a one-handed back shoulder catch in the red zone, uh, you know, for a touchdown, got his feet in bounds. It was just a play that nobody on this roster, and I guess probably besides Odell, could have made last season. And if, you know, obviously if you watch Brandon Marshall through the years, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, a big part of, of his repertoire. So I think you see a piece right there that, while wow, that could be a big difference. Uh, obviously the tight ends with Engram, you know, kind of flash what, what they think he can be. Red Ellison wasn't on the field a lot, but I think everyone kind of knows that he's going to be, a, you know, a solid piece. So you just you just add those three guys alone, uh, you, you know, you have to think they're upgrades um, over the guys at those positions last year. So you would think that the offense is going to take the next step. Obviously, we have to make sure the uh, the offensive line, uh, you know, holds up. But there's definitely a lot of reason for optimism. Whereas last year, I think, you know, the offense had put up good numbers in the past, in the previous two years. But now you look back, it seemed a little bit like fool's gold. And now I think there's genuine reasons for optimism because they, you know, they do have talented players, uh, you know, filled in some spots that were kind of weak in the past. And of course, on top of that, they have the mo- one of the most talented players in the league, Odell Beckham, who's been a big part of the conversation this offseason. James, you had a chance to go out to an event. Uh, he was at on Saturday night. We're doing this podcast on a Monday after uh, mini camp ended. Uh, tell us about that and, and kind of where we're at right now with Odell, who did show up, obviously, for the mini camp. You know, it was, uh, you know, he's the second, um, I guess, his pro camp, you know, the big kind of company that runs these youth football camps. Uh, 600 kids at Kane University. Uh, and look, Odell was a rock star. I mean, the one, I mean, I think that a lot of times 
you know, people kind of don't get the full picture of Odell. I mean, I think a lot of times people also don't want to pay attention when the full picture is presented. You know, he's a guy who you, you look at him, he, you know, he's a rock star. He's great with the kids. The kids love him. You know, I, I think that that's one of the big things that I think that is going to be kind of going forward. You know, because I think Odell obviously is going to be kind of the story of the Giants season is that people have to kind of see the full picture. You know, I, I think some people paint him as this villain, and then some people basically make an excuse and defend every single thing he does as if, you know, he does no wrong. And I think it's somewhere in the middle. The one thing that he did was, you know, he did a little media session, didn't talk a whole heck of a lot about, you know, the Giants or the coming NFL season, but he said that he feels that he is as prepared for this season as any season he's ever been before. Obviously, he didn't go to OTAs, which we all talked about a lot about. He was out in Los Angeles training. I came back for mini camp. I mean, I think some people are trying to bang this. Is he going to hold out? I mean, I don't really – one, Odell basically said that he doesn't think holdouts work, so you got to keep – you know, buy him on that. And then two, I don't think anybody really goes to mandatory mini camp and then doesn't show up for training camp. It just seems like it would be kind of the other way around. So I think Odell's going to be there, and the Giants just have to, you know, hope that they get his best this year. And then I think from the Giants' perspective – they probably think that you know they'll talk about a contract after this season. I'm sure Odell would like to talk about a contract right now, but I think given everything that's kind of happened in his career and especially the way last season ended, I think the Giants are probably in a position where they want to see him, you know, make good on all this talk that he's matured and he gets it now and everything and get through a whole season without any major issues and then they'll go talk about the big money. I mean, he's going to get paid at some point. I mean, I don't think anyone denies that. I don't think anyone denies that he is overperformed his salary 10 times over. I just think the Giants want to see him kind of – everything he's saying, all the right things, I think the Giants want to see him do the right things for a season, and then they'll revisit the situation. Yeah, he'll be there. I mean, he's going to have to show up. Otherwise, the fines are ridiculous, and this thing would become a circus. So that will be a fun topic whenever it comes up again, and I'm sure it will. Uh, but he'll be on this roster. We know that. You guys wrote about some roster projections to kind of look ahead to what the 53-man could be. And, of course, your readers, NJ.com, uh, responded to a lot of this. And there's, there's a lot of talk about who might or might not make this roster, especially at the back end. Dan, what are you thinking now in terms of some of those tough decisions the Giants might have when we get to late August? Yeah, I mean, obviously you do it by position and you try and make the numbers add up. And, and some positions are a little tougher than others. I think uh, on offense, it's going to be really interesting to see how the numbers break down with, say, running back, fullback, tight ends, and wide receivers. Because if you go by last year, they carried five running backs, no fullbacks, I want to say three tight ends, and, and six wide receivers. So even if the cumulative number ends up being the same, I could see the divide being uh, different. Like I, I can't see a reason to carry five running backs this year. Uh, I, mean, I think it's going to come down to maybe like Orleans Darqua and Sean Drone for that last spot because you've got to figure uh, Perkins, Vereen, and, and Gallman, and the draft pick, are all safe. So I don't think you need to carry five running backs again. And then you say, well, now it's an extra roster spot. Does it go to a fullback? Um, which I think everyone's kind of interested to see how serious are they about fullbacks. And I don't really have a strong feeling on, on how they're going to go with that until we really get into training camp. It's the kind of the, the refrain you hear all spring is, you know, until the pads come on. That, that applies to obviously every player, but some positions more than others. And I think fullback is, you know, probably near the top of the list because what can you really tell from a fullback if he's not, you know, going through the line and hitting somebody? That's the, pretty much the, uh, <laughs> the job description. Tight end is going to be super interesting because – Went from the thinnest position, you know, on the roster to, to I don't want to say one of the deepest, but there's definitely some some good pieces there. And like I mentioned, Angram and Ellison, you know, those guys are obviously going to make the team. Beyond then, it depends how many guys are they going to keep, and then it's going to be an interesting battle. We got Matt Lacoste, who had a great spring. Who's that's not the first time though. He's had great off seasons in the past, so we'll see if he can you know, finally get over the hump and stay healthy. But then you have a guy like Jarrell Adams, who was a sixth-round pick last year. I mean, they obviously like to to keep their draft picks. But then Will Ty's been the most productive out of those three. So uh, I got to think at least one of those guys is not going to be on this this roster. So that'll be uh, interesting to see how that shakes out. And then wide receiver, do they need to carry six again this year? I mean, I think obviously the top three in you know, in Odell, Sterling Shepard, and Brandon Marshall are locks. And Tavares King certainly uh, has done enough, in my opinion, to – to warrant not only a roster spot, but probably more of a, a role this year after he's really produced and you know, every time he's got a shot, whether it's last preseason uh, or the end of last season. 
Dwayne Harris is a you know big time special teams guy, and I think you know just a decent guy to have around because you know he's shown that he can you know play as a receiver. So then it's another kind of interesting battle. Does it, you know they carry that sixth guy, and is it Roger Lewis who you know had the arrest this off season, which is obviously a big strike against him. You have Darius Powell, and then Travis Rudolph was kind of everybody's you know favorite undrafted free agent. So. Uh, I think those are some interesting, uh, you know, position battles kind of towards the end of the roster uh, on the offensive side of the ball and then even offensive line. And a lot of people think that they uh, should carry nine offensive linemen. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me when they barely have five good ones. So I don't know why you want to stock up at that position. I mean, I think uh, a lot of these guys, you know, the young guys, especially whether it's Chad Wheeler or Jessamine Dunker, I think they'll be able to sneak them to the practice squad. I know fans tend to overvalue, uh, you know, your own team's undrafted free agents, but uh, odds are if they can't crack the top eight for the Giants offensive line, I don't think they're going to be in, in huge demand. So uh, I guess I kind of just did the offensive rundowns of James Wants to take the defense. But I think those are kind of the, the most intriguing things. It's always a numbers game. And it's just, you know, how are the positions going to break down? Are you going to carry, you know, X at this position? Well, you got to take it away from that position and, and vice versa. So I think that's always uh, the interesting, interesting thing to monitor. Before I get to the defense, the offense, two things stand out to me. I don't think Dan mentioned the quarterback situation. Uh, the the fan discourse about the the backup quarterback situation fascinates me. You've got this camp of fans who just seem convinced that Geno Smith, like he now he's a giant. There's gonna be this magic wand, and he's suddenly going to be this like the best backup quarterback in the NFL. And I I don't I'm not and I think Dan will test this well. I don't I think there's a very good chance that Geno wins the backup job. And I think if all things are equal, he's probably more talented. Obviously, he's younger than Josh Johnson, but I, I still think that Josh Johnson has the inside track to get the job. And I think, you know, I saw a tweet, I forget where it was, but said, you know, when it comes to backup quarterbacks in the NFL, you know, if a guy is on the same page with the offensive coordinator and the head coach, and he knows the system inside and out, that guy, that ability and that knowledge can often overcome a talent deficit. So I, I think there's a very good chance with all this talk about Geno that Geno may not even be on the roster when we get to September because Josh Johnson, as long as he doesn't get blown away in the summer, is going to hold the job. And the other thing I would say is Davis Webb is not going to be the backup quarterback this year, barring a stunning summer. I think all these Giants fans, you know, Tom Coughlin has made the idea of carrying three quarterbacks like toxic to most fans. They did it last year, and I think they're going to do it again, and you're going to see Webb. I and mean, McAdoo basically said that a rookie quarterback, with some exceptions, is not ready to be the number two in his first season. So I think you're going to see Webb be the three, probably inactive every week, if not, you know, most weeks, and I think you see Johnson or Smith. My guess is Johnson will be the number two. I think Dan had Geno there, but I think Johnson will win it. And the offensive line, you know, there's a lot of talk about DJ Fluker uh, coming into this season. You know, that he was kind of the, the biggest addition they made. I look at him, and I, you know, he was working with second team right guard. And obviously, when training camp comes, I think you'll see more of guys moving around positions and everything. But you know, DJ Fluker, you know. They only guaranteed him a million and a half. They would save one point five million if he if he gets cut at the end of training camp against the cap. They like Biznawati. If a guy like Chad Wheeler or Jessamine Dunker comes on strong and, and Bobby Hart has a good camp, I think there's a chance that DJ Fluker may not even make it to the roster. I, I think that's a small chance at this point, but I, I do think there's a chance that he doesn't even make it, and that's probably a good thing for the Giants because that means they have had younger guys stand out it's funny because you were saying thing about davis webb and yeah. uh, you know his standing on the quarterback depth chart he's probably going to be the guy I, I predict right now that you guys write the most about mm-hmm. and we talk the most about during the summer just because of you know for all the reasons that are obvious he could be the future quarterback of the team that never actually puts a uniform on on a sunday this whole season i could see him being inactive the entire year as the number three unless unless something wacky happens but you know we'll talk a lot about him in the summer and then when September hits we won't see him actually in a uniform on game day it's funny how that that could work out but obviously that's just the numbers game I'll throw something more in on web to kind of follow up with James's point too I've, it, there does seem to be this momentum of he could be the number two quarterback which is understandable because a fans are excited about draft pick and b the early reports from people like us have been positive but again I think it's getting carried away because you go back McAdoo couldn't have basically said it any clearer that he doesn't want a rookie quarterback to be the backup. And, and sure, Webb looked good in limited reps in OTAs and minicamp, 
that's still a long way from, you know, this kid was, there was lots of questions him coming in, making the transition, uh, you know, from the air raid offense in college. So now you're going to say within a three month span, he's going to be mastering the offense enough that if God forbid anything happened to Eli Manning, he could step in and, and run an NFL offense. I mean, he works hard, all that stuff about being a coach's son. Uh, he's backed it up and then son, as far as his, his dedication, I saw him at an event, a charity event. And, you know, it was just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze with him. And he said something about, oh, I like doing these, but I'd rather be studying. I mean, and I don't know, maybe he's just putting on a good show for the media, but it was a casual conversation. And I, I think it's really genuine. He really loves to study that much. But that's what this year is about. It's basically, you know, to put in college terms, it's a red shirt year. Um, and he's just not going to get enough reps this summer. You have four quarterbacks. Obviously, Eli has to get his reps, and that's the number one priority. But you, won't, if their plan right now is it's going to be Geno or Josh Johnson as the number two, they need to get a lot of reps. They need to get a lot of reps in games because, again, if that's your plan right now, I, I, Davis Webb would have to absolutely blow everyone away in those first couple weeks in training camp to move up enough to even get the reps in games to really convince them that they're number two. And then they would have to ditch the plan that they clearly have of having you know a veteran number two. So I just think – it's great. Anything he does this year is a bonus. If he looks great in practice, great. We'll see you next year, and then you can be the number two after a full year. I just think it's a super long shot that he could be the number two uh, this year. Yeah, I agree with that. It just it doesn't seem like it, it makes sense for what they're trying to be and what they're doing this year. James, how about the defense, and what stands out to you is kind of the numbers crunch that we'll talk about over the summer? I think that the defensive line is going to be really fascinating because, you know, when they drafted Dalvin Tomlinson, I, I think a lot of people thought, okay, that he's just going to slide right in where Jonathan Hankins was right next to Snacks, and, and they're going to keep chugging along. Robert Thomas was running with the first team defense, uh, OTAs and minicamp when we were there. We didn't see a whole heck of a lot out of Dalvin Tomlinson. I know it's early, but I think that there's a, there's a lot – the chances of the Giants, you know, going with Thomas as a starter uh, or having some sort of rotation with Tomlinson and Bromley and, and Thomas, I think is a lot greater than, than Tomlinson just being the starter. I think that he's going to play, but I don't think he's necessarily just going to be put in there as the starter from day one. You know, no questions asked. He's basically there the whole time. I think also the defensive end situation. You got a lot of guys there. I mean, JPP and OV, obviously. You signed Devin Taylor. You bring in Okwara back. You drafted Avery Moss. Oh, oh, did you do it? No one really knows what his situation is going to be. You got Kerry Wynn, who you, know, you gave a restricted free agent tender to, but again, that's not guaranteed. They can go to him to make him a pay cut. They could also cut him at the end of the summer, save about you know, $1.797 million against the cap. So I, I think the defensive line situation, you know, how, do they carry five ends? Do they carry six ends? You know, last year, they only dress three defensive tackles most weeks on game days. The only time when they would dress all four was when they'd have an injury at defensive end. So I wonder, you know, are they going to carry four defensive tackles on the 53? I tend to think they would, but if they're only going to dress three on game days, they could probably have the fourth guy be someone on the practice squad. You know, and they might, you know, a guy like Josh Banks, Banks, an undrafted free agent, they like him. You know, maybe Jerron Jones, uh, He's moved offensive line, but obviously maybe they use him as both on the practice squad. Maybe that's their plan. You know, obviously he's a guy I think probably could sneak through waivers if he's just playing on the line, which he's just kind of learning this summer. Linebacker, relatively thin. I, I think Dan had them carrying seven. I had him carrying six. I think the big question there is, you know, what are they going to do with JT Thomas? Does he stay uh, at his current deal? Does he take a pay cut and stay? Does he get released? I mean, they would save three million against the cap and. I'm, this is for later podcasts, but you know they're going to have somewhat of a cap crunch next year, so they could save themselves a little bit of money here or there. Cornerback, the top big three guys are set. I, I think the big competition is going to be for those fourth and fifth spots. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But I think the most intriguing position on the defense is safety. Landon Collins is a given. I think Darian Thompson's a given. Andrew Adams, I think, is pretty close to a given after the way he played last year as an undrafted rookie out of nowhere. But do they carry four? Or do they carry five? I mean, what happens with Nat Burhe? Uh, you know, Michael Thompson. You know, he's been working at cornerback. How, what position is he counting against? Does he see more safety time? Uh, Duke Nacho, the veteran they signed. What do they do with him? You know, Jadar Johnson, undrafted rookie out of Clemson, had a had a good off season program. Eric Pinkins is a guy who's really kind of fascinating. He can do multiple things. He's so big and fast and strong. So that's a position I think is really really a major numbers crunch is safety. And I think you're going to see a couple of guys who are draft picks or the Giants really like, they're going to be on the outside looking in once the cut down day comes. Yeah, I did. I did seven linebackers and that was pretty much the position that got the most feedback of people questioning it. And as I look at it, you know, I think 
if I could change something, I probably would go five safeties because I think that position is a little bit deeper and a lot of those guys are maybe a little more interchangeable. So do you want to cut ties with Nat Burhe to keep, you know, Deontay Skinner or, or JT Thomas again if they need to free up a few bucks? But I, I think it's, it's the same as offense. It's all going to be the numbers and how, how they break down. The reason why I favored seven linebackers was twofold. A, that's what they did last year. So we don't have a very big sample size with what Ben McAdoo, how he likes his roster constructed. So I kind of went in doubt. I just <laughs> followed what they did last year. And secondly, those guys are core special teams players, pretty much more than any other position. I feel like linebackers are guys who you can use, uh, you know, on, on every unit. And that's obviously uh, carries a little bit more value than that's why I don't think carrying a ninth offensive lineman, that guy's just not going to play, basically. So uh, a linebacker's guy you can put on punt return, punt coverage, all that type of thing. So uh, that's where I think that that is uh, a valuable position, but they don't have a ton of talent there. So I could easily see them. Uh, you know, you know, moving in that position to adding another safety. Um, cornerback, I think, is the position that's crying out for a veteran addition, same way they did with Leon Hall last training camp. Even they did Cody Sensabaugh during the season. And obviously both of those guys aren't even back. So uh, they didn't really make any big additions there. Didn't draft anyone there, which I think was kind of a surprise. Valentino Blake was the one free agent they added. And I really – he – really didn't show me anything uh you know during the spring michael hunter who was mostly on the practice squad last year clearly is ahead of blake and uh blake got pretty much no guaranteed money so he shouldn't feel super comfortable again because i think that this position is crying out for them to go find someone kind of off the scrap heap or after cut down even uh to bring in because at that position you got those top three guys who are all studs but drc you know has a little bit of an injury history eli apple didn't you know show to be super durable as a rookie even jenkins missed a little bit of time so that, that's a position where they found on that playoff game uh, you know how critical depth is and there's no way they can feel comfortable uh, you know with where they are at cornerback right now i don't think if they had a veteran i think last year obviously they added leon hall and that didn't really work out from a corner when was that when was that hall signing they signed him well the, leon hall if i remember correctly he visited at some point during the spring Right. And they brought him back the second time, I think, day or two into training camp and signed him. Okay. Now, obviously, he didn't really work out as a cornerback. He was inactive for a couple of weeks. Then he kind of worked his way back in in the safety situation toward the end of the season and gave him a little bit of play. And obviously, they, they added Sensible. The, the DRC is fascinating for me because I know fans, they, they get very upset when we say this, but, you know, they would save seven million dollars if they were to kind of trade or release him at some point this summer, and if they add a veteran cornerback and look, I, I, there's some guys out there, but you know, again, it's not a guarantee because we saw what happened with the Hall sign necessarily, didn't necessarily work out the way they wanted to. If a guy like Michael Hunter or you know uh, Valentino Blake, if they have really good camps and they add a veteran guy who can play in the slot. I just wonder if they would make a move there thinking forward to next year and that, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot of cap space. I don't think they would because this team obviously would not be as good without DRC as it is with DRC. But he only played 66% of the defensive snaps last year. He does have injury issues from time to time. And I just wonder if they got a veteran who really worked out, as Dan said. And I, I agree with Dan. I do think that adding a veteran is something that, you know, Ben McAdoo wants to play young players, but I think he's proven that when he gets into a situation where he has to add a veteran, he does. And I think you maybe you saw that with Corbin Bryant on the defensive tackle spot. I think that's kind of insurance that in a perfect world for the Giants, probably the three younger guys, they, they play well in camp and they don't have to bring the veteran. They just let him go. But I think it's insurance. I do wonder if they got a veteran in and some of those young guys played well, if they might make a cost-cutting decision I'm not saying it would be the right decision because I think it would hurt them in terms of an on-field product, but they might do that thinking forward to Richburg, Pugh, Odell, Collins, all those contracts coming up. I got to think that that ship's kind of sailed, though, because at this point you can cut him after the season and get that same savings for those guys. Uh, I mean, he's – I just you think he's, 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 he's too good. I mean, I, I mean, it would definitely made sense well, for us to – kind of speculate on it this off season because you didn't know what their cap situation was going to be, what JVP was going to cost, you know, if they were going to go get a left tackle. then. You, but he's, you know, he was an all-pro last year. So it would be, I think the fans would revolt if they did it. And I just think they have so little depth there. I'd, I'd have a hard time really justifying that. And, 
we have to say, I mean, a lot of, you know, the media speculated about it and it was kind of informed speculation, but the Giants have never actually really said that that was on the table. So, I mean, I, you know, it's, yeah. we, can't re- we can't really say that, like, oh, they were about to do it and they pulled back. I mean, there was talk more almost probably, you know, after they drafted Eli Apple that his days might have been numbered and then he had a great season and he, you know, was a great teammate as far as accepting the change of the slot, which I don't care what anybody tells you, he didn't like that. And uh, he's kind of, you know, again, been a good teammate and done and obviously excelled there. Uh, but I think if he had his druthers, he'd be playing on the outside. So uh, I just I can't see him doing it now because I don't know if it'd be worth it. And, and he's such a big piece and such a good player that especially if Eli Apple goes hurt, you'd feel a lot better about sliding yeah. DRC out there than and putting Michael Hunter in as your number two corner. So I think he's just too valuable. I, mean, I get what you're saying, but I just think at this point, I think we've kind of passed uh, you know the point of, of DRC being on the chopping block. I feel like Giants fans would be upset at this point, right? I mean, the, they're in a win now year, and it just feels like. That would be, and like you said it, James, that would be with the idea and the eye on Pew and future contracts and next year. If they were in a different spot and his age and everything you said makes sense, but it feels like they're almost as all in as they can be while not trying to ruin their future. But they're trying to win a championship this year. It'd be counterproductive to cut him. Oh, it definitely would be. and I don't think they would do it. I just kind of throwing it out there because, you know, you look at it, I mean, $7 million this year, $6.5 million next year. I mean, they would basically be heaping $13 million onto whatever their cap space is if you assume that there's going to be rollover from this year. So I think that's something that, again, it's a very – it's remote. I think it's a 1% chance it happens. But if they did add a veteran corner and some of these younger guys had strong camps and Michael Hunter played really well in the offseason program – I do think it would get a little interesting, especially also if Michael Thompson, you know, who's got to be healthy, he was dinged up again at the end of mini camp. You know, if he also showed well as a slot corner, so just something to keep in mind. But I agree with you guys; uh, it would be a detriment to their on-field product, and I think it's not going to happen. But I think it's always going to kind of linger out there until the day either he finishes his contract or they actually do cut him. All right, let's uh, let's do this. I, I wanted to do a, like a quick hitting segment this week, and I was going to get to one. A name, but I, I figure let's just make him part of this because I know you guys want to talk about it my way. So I have six names, and we'll make this kind of like a word association where I say the name, and then you give me whatever comes to your mind in terms of their off season, in terms of the season ahead, like whatever you think of uh, when this name comes to mind. Uh, we'll go with that. So we'll start with James. We'll go to Dan. I have six. We'll we'll do three each. All right, James, you're up first. Okay. Number one, Evan Engram, the first round pick from the 2017 draft for the Giants. So far, so good. I like that. And I think fans will like that, too, because he's a guy that was a lot of angst when he was drafted and what he'd be. So, so far, so good. The, the, the hype train has kind of left the station with that. Yeah, it's kind of like we didn't mention him, I, I don't think, in the first half hour of the show. Yeah, no, I, I just think my big thing with Evan Ingram, and I've been kind of adamant since draft night, I think Evan Ingram has the ability to be a really good player in the NFL. I just – my thought process at the draft was, is this really the, the, the tight end that this team needed? Now, look, so far they have used him all over the field, the speed, the size. He could be an impact player immediately. But, again, we have to get to the regular season and see them do this because it's one thing to be very creative in the controlled environment of the Quest Diagnostics Training Center. It's another thing to get to the season and to use them in all these versatile ways when injuries are going to come in a pack, performance is going to come in a pack. And the bottom line is that the, you know, the Giants were just so predictable on offense this year. Now, Dan said, it looks like this offense has a chance with the additions, maybe you know, some new creativity to kind of break through again. But I, I think that's why I say so. So far, so good with Ingram. I, I do think that expectations might be getting a teensy bit too high for him. But I, I think that so far he's looked like he could be what the Giants envision him as. But it's going to be one thing to, to look like it and one thing to execute it once the season starts. Dan, Eric Flowers. Uh, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, I would say cautiously optimistic, but I don't think too many people are exercising caution. I mean, the Giants, he's their guy, so clearly they're going to talk him up kind of at every turn although it's funny it's Mac has probably been the one guy who hasn't been you know going crazy with the hype and which is you know sort of his mo anyways but you know Mike Sullivan made a comment that he's worked out at the facility and all of a sudden that turned into like this guy's turned the corner and watch out here comes the pro bowl everyone thought they were getting three years ago I mean look it's great that he worked hard this offseason 
I don't know that there was really a big knock that he went down to Miami and sat on the couch and played video games the past two off seasons. So the fact that he worked out in New Jersey is good. I mean, again, he showed his commitment. He was here, put in the work, you know, looks a bit leaner. Again, I don't know that his weight was a huge problem. So all this stuff is kind of in- intangible. It's great that he worked hard, showed devotion. Is it going to make him a, a significantly better player? I have my reservations, and I don't see how you can feel otherwise unless it's just blind faith because we have two years of film. Usually guys make the leap either between year one and year two or when their role increases. Like if he didn't play a lot the first two years and he was shaky in the preseason, but all of a sudden he's putting it all together and he's going to be the starter and and he could really take off. But he played a ton, and, and there's so much bad film and so much bad play that, yes, he could certainly get better. But the technique issues have been there since Miami. So I don't know that him dropping a few pounds, he didn't even say how many pounds it was, uh, is going to make a significant difference. You know, And I don't think even his conditioning was really the problem. I mean, he, he was terrible early in games, middle of games, late in games at different points. I'm not saying his whole entire year was terrible. But I mean, if you remember the Pittsburgh game, it was right out of the, right out of the gates where he got, gave up the safety on the hold in the end zone. The Dallas game, he was terrible in the first quarter. There was plenty of games where he was bad kind of all throughout. So I think it's easy – in the spring to get caught up in sort of narratives. It's like, you know, anyone's ever covered baseball. Every player shows up to spring training in the best shape of their life. And then they go hit 240 if they're a 240 hitter. That's just pretty much how it goes. Certainly there are exceptions. Maybe flowers will be that exception, but simply the fact that he worked hard this off season, there's a lot of guys who work hard in the NFL that aren't just very good. That's where I'm going to put flowers until proven otherwise. James, Eli Manning. That's a really tough one. All right, I'll say this. I've been kind of bouncing this idea around in my head. Are we potentially on the verge of the steel line that Bill Simmons used to use with, with Tom Brady of getting Eli Manning's, pardon my, you know, somewhat French, FU season? In terms of everyone thinks he's on Everyone the thinks decline. he's done. He's got the, right. the, the, the memorabilia stuff. They drafted Davis Webb. I mean, I'm just saying, you think about it, this could be a situation where they've added all these offensive weapons. If the line can be just a little bit better, could we kind of maybe get some, you know, maybe Eli Manning's last great season this year? Eli is what, 36 or 37? 36. So just for reference sake, just just for fun, I went and looked at his brother and his trajectory. And, and not, they're different players, obviously, yeah. but, you know, they're brothers. Um 36 was Peyton's comeback season off of the neck injury, mm-hmm. and he obviously had a ridiculous year. And then the next year they went to the Super Bowl. So uh, just, just as that frame of reference, like we, we talk about 36 as if it's you're done and old. We've seen quarterbacks recently. Obviously Peyton's better, and so is Brady. But just to go off your point, Jays, we've seen quarterbacks recently have big years at 36-37. Yeah, I just think I, – I go back to the playoff game, and I know the Giants you know, didn't play very well in that game, but Eli was really whipping the ball all over the park in that first quarter, first half. I mean, you, and that's why I just come back to it, is that you never really saw a physical decline in Eli last year. He just didn't play well, and I didn't think that he really had you know, necessarily all the tools around him. Uh, they've gone out and they've gotten him the tools. Now, again, I don't know how much the offensive line is going to be better. A lot of that's going to depend on Flowers, as Dan just talked about a second ago. But – I just wonder if, you know, all this kind of talk about Eli being done, they drafted a guy, the stuff off the field, you know, Eli really hasn't, uh, he hasn't been as out and about as he usually was in, in the off season. Um, all his usual, you know, charity events and, and community events, he's been at them, but, you know, that haven't really been, you know, they haven't really opened him up to the media and everything. Uh, it, it just seems, I don't know, I just think there's a chance that, that maybe, maybe Eli's got, you know, one more great, you know, statistical season left in him and maybe we get that this year maybe it's kind of the perfect storm you know it seems like there's a lot of heat on Eli I'm intrigued to see how he kind of responds to it this year yeah no it it would it would be fun if he had that it obviously would give us a lot to talk about it. it would it would make for a fun season if if he had a gigantic year one more time Dan Odell Beckham Jr. <laughs> Uh, just kind of the, the the center of the the circus, I and mean, he's just always in the spotlight. Uh, that that <laughs> that didn't change this off season. If anything, it became kind of more the case. I mean, he's just such a uh, interesting character. I mean, the fact that he comes out and does that first press conference, which t- tip his hat to him, because Tom Brady didn't speak all off season, and they think it's because he didn't want to address Giselle's 
concussion thing, so that really isn't even that big of a controversy. But you can easily just duck the media if you want the spring. And there was a million cameras and reporters there for that first day of mini camp. And Odell easily could have seen that and said, oh, okay, screw you, I'm not talking, and come back tomorrow, and I probably won't talk then. He could have done all that, so I, I tipped my hat that he went up there. Uh, press conference was a little bit meandering. He couldn't really stay on point of why he, he missed OTAs, but that's beside the point. He went up, spoke, was was congenial for obviously a lot of people have ripped him, and he didn't, you know, he wasn't combative. He was up there for like 12 minutes, which is long for these things. So that, you walk away, think, oh wow, that was really you know impressive that Odell did that. And then of course his you know cleat artist, which how many guys even have a cleat artist, posts on social media. Close up photos of the cleats that he wore, which have like, you know, the New York Post and TMZ and ESPN and some media outlets with, you know, either their names crossed out in red ink or, or shh, like in red ink over them, obviously telling them to be quiet, silence the critics, that type of thing. And it's just, it's just funny. I mean, that's just how he is. He's a, he's a master of keeping himself. Uh, you know, in the headlines, and and it's why, it's why I, f- I find it funny when some of his critics will say, you know, why is everyone focused so much on Odell? Well, I mean, he clearly covets the spotlight, and he's brilliant at it. He knows how to make himself be in the spotlight. I mean, if no one, it's who sees your cleats when you're you know 50 yards away watching? No one would have known except that his guy who has become famous because he's associated with Odell puts it out and then that becomes a story and then some of the outlets even talked to Brandon Marshall and got his reaction and of course our photographers are taking pictures of his cleats every practice now now probably going forward for the rest of time you're going to see in a gallery of a Giants practice what Odell has in his cleats so I don't know if he thought it all that far out from a marketing standpoint but it was brilliant and it just is a little microcosm of who this guy is I mean he, he you clearly come right back on the field and you can just see there was a punt return drill and he made like one cut and it's like you hadn't seen anything like that all spring. I mean, he's clearly just so physically talented, and I think any concerns about him on the field, he's in great shape. He's going to have a great season, as always. Um, but the, the circus is never going to end because he, he kind of enjoys it too much. It's, it's made him who he is. It's why he signed that deal with Nike. Um, but that's kind of the thing that I, I just felt like that little story about the cleats and the media and everything just summed him up so well that he can he can kind of be one way and then do something else. And like James said earlier, it's 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 the full the full picture with him. You never you can't you can't typecast him as he's a good guy, he's a bad guy, he's this or that. He's just so many things wrapped into one, which is why everyone is so interested in him in the first place. So uh, just kind of a fascinating guy. And like I said, I don't think anything is going to change as far as him being you know in the middle of everything at all times. And so it'll be uh, another season of. Of, of you know channeling uh, chronicling his every move every move every day every touchdown it'll be the old Al Beckham story it, it's layered like like you said it, he is layered and everything around him always is James wait, one more each for you guys okay. to wrap up this episode for you Ben McAdoo big test big well test. that's true I mean look I think that 11 know, 5 last year but a lot of people still aren't, I don't think a lot of people are still sold on him yet it's not even that it's just that Eleven and five, but I think that you know one offense his thing was not good. That has to improve. Big, you know, major. You know, they had to make major strides, and the whole thing of you know he's going to call the plays, and we really haven't discussed that. Although I'm sure, don't worry. Day one of training camp, we'll ask him if he's going to call the plays this year. He he loves that question. He's let us know that. But you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people think that he should give up the play calling duties as head coach. He's not going to do that. So I think. He's going to have to prove that you know that's right. Because I, I do think that if this team, what, no matter how many wins or losses they have, if they struggle again on offense the way they did last year, this season, I would think that John Mara is going to have to sit him down and be like, look, this is going to have to change now. I don't think they're at that point yet. But also, I mean, there are going to be a lot of expectations on this team. I mean, someone – Somewhere we'll pick them to go to a major outlet, you know, Preview Magazine, ESPN, you know, Fox Sports. Someone's going to pick them to go to the Super Bowl. Someone's going to pick them to win the Super Bowl. The fans are thinking Super Bowl. I'm sure the local media, there'll be people thinking Super Bowl. They've added, you know, all these additions, a lot of big personalities in this locker room. You know, obviously Odell, Brandon Marshall, the whole Eli Davis Webb situation, which I don't think is going to be a, a big deal this year, but it is something that's going to be kind of, you know, li- always there, lingering, you know, in the back of everyone's head. You know, JPP is big personality, you know, moves and everything. So only one ball to go around with all these guys on offense. So I think it's a big test for Ben Maku. It's We're really going to kind of get to learn a lot more about who he is as a coach and everything. He had a great first season, but uh, the, the stakes, I think, are going to be definitely higher this year. Last year, he was just kind of, you know, it was kind of gravy. They had a good season, but I also think if they had gone 8-8 eight and eight or 9-7, and seven, most people would have been okay with it. After the fact, you know, they just fired Tom Coughlin and they missed the playoffs for four straight years. But, 
There's, there's going to be a lot of a lot of expectations, a, a lot of buzz around this team, and they've kind of become, you know, the, really. I don't know. I think maybe the Yankees are probably the most fascinating team in town right now. Obviously, with all the young guys there and Judge, but I think the Giants are right there. I mean, they're they're, they're kind of. I don't want to say they're they're not a circus, but they're definitely entertaining and there's a lot going on there and I think that you know Ben McAdoo's the guy who's got to kind of manage it all and, and keep the, the train on the track so it's a big test for him this year you didn't even mention the biggest McAdoo storyline of the spring oh that's the right. hair <laughs> I, I threw, that, that's kind of why I threw it out because I, I, I need to talk about that hair yeah I don't even know I don't that came from left field I mean this is I mean he had I mean he literally had you know Barstool Sports you know making shirts about his hair last year with the kind of like that that bowl cut with like a, a middle part which you, you know you don't really see too often and then all of a sudden to come out with this like Pat Riley slick back do it it it, uh, it caught everyone by surprise I mean it's not often that a head coach's haircut can generate you know a story yes. from every outlet covering a practice but sure enough I mean it was it was too good to, uh, <laughs> to I resist. almost wonder I I wonder if we're going to see that when we get to training camp. I, I would say it's like 50-50. That he's, but it's like what I want to know is obviously like we're not going to go super in depth on this guy's hair. I mean that'd be kind of weird. But is this like a is this his thing now? Was he just kind of screwing with us? I mean, is his hair? Did, I mean, obviously he got a haircut, but is it basically the same haircut and he, and he just slicked it back a little bit? I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah I, I think we need. I think we need a full story on this. I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, I and, just. To use the Showtime reference, like you know, maybe maybe that means he's predicting a big season here. Like we're talking five hundred points. You know, Showtime coming to East Rutherford. I, well, the true test will be: is he show up for anything with like a tailored suit? Because that would be <laughs> that would be the ultimate turnaround. You know, I mean, he's you know, going I, to New York. I think ben enjoys this this kind of like internet persona that you know that obviously Barstool has has greatly helped. I, I I would not shock him if he was just having a little fun. But I just what I want to know is was that just something that he was trying out and that he could you know for all we know he's on a, an island someplace uh, you know at a body of water and he's already flipped back or <laughs> is he going to stick with this? Because I'm going to be honest with you, you know I look I don't have great hair, but I thought that the I'm not a big gel guy, so I thought that his first look was a little bit better, was superior. I'll, I'll say that. I mean it doesn't really matter to me how a guy wants to wear his hair, but. I do think that the original Benny with the good hair was, was a little bit better. Yeah, I'm looking for a full uh, persona change, like from the down-to-earth <laughs> Western Pennsylvania guy to like Hollywood Ben. Like that's what I'm looking for. He's going to be out at One Oak with Odell or something after a game. <laughs> now that that would be a story right there. He's right, on we'll the end boat with this. next year. After Damn, a... we'll end with this word association or phrase association. Um, a guy that's a big name on the Giants that we talk about a lot, but yet he got his contract and he's back and we know it and it's, it's kind of been quiet. Uh, Jason Pierre-Paul. The thing that sticks out about him is just the perspective he's gained. I mean, it's really amazing. Like, I wasn't around the team on a daily basis, but I covered him a little bit earlier in his career. And just, you know, being a football fan, you, you kind of knew he had this kind of quirky personality. Obviously, was, you know, sort of... Uh, a free spirit, I guess we'll say, and then had the fireworks accident, which easily could have ruined his career and kind of made him just the butt of jokes and and really just, you know, again, put him in a, a really bad light. Um, and the way he's turned it around, I mean, he he's just a he's an interesting guy. I mean, he's almost like a little bit of a mini Odell doesn't generate nearly the amount of attention, but he's definitely has some personality quirks. But it's funny to see this development. He's he's one of like the more respected voices, I feel like, in that locker room because he's been through so much. And he's come out the other end again with this perspective where he spoke, you know, before they broke from, uh, you know, the offseason break, which is easily the longest six weeks on the calendar for NFL front offices and coaches because you got a lot of young players with disposable income and a lot of free time and warm weather and parties and all that type of stuff. So uh, and, and, and JPP said, I'm living proof of basically what can go wrong. And he said that, you know, you got to do the right things in this off season. And it's just interesting to see the, just the change this guy's made. I mean, he's obviously not, you know, super old, but he's been around a long time and uh, has really matured. And I think also on the field, he was really coming into, you know, his old form right before the injury last year. And they get five sacks in the two games, you know, leading into that. And I know a lot of people wanted to dismiss, Oh, you know, three sacks against the Browns. I mean, they're still NFL players and find me the other teams who had a defensive end who had three sacks against the Browns. It's, it's, it's still an accomplishment. It's still to go out there in an NFL game, and get three sacks. Um, um, but so I think he's ready to, you know, he even had a great line where someone asked him if his contract adds pressure and he said, no, I'm, I'm already, you know, thinking about getting another one. So, I mean, he's, he's really got the right attitude and I think 
you know, another year removed. I mean, we can't under, understate the fact that this guy blew off like half of his right hand. <laughs> um, that's going to have an impact. And I think he clearly made huge strides last year. And I think, you know, obviously assuming the core injury and everything um, is behind him, he, he was a full participant this spring. Another year with getting used to playing with, you know, the, the, you know, the damaged hand. I think he's going to be even better. I mean, I really do. I think he's going to have a great year. I think him and that Vernon combination is going to take the next step. I, and I think you saw glimpses of it last year, especially right before he got hurt. But uh, he's just a guy who really has kind of come full circle here. It's really impressive uh, to just kind of see uh, the guy he's matured into. I think he's a, you know, it's a big piece of this team. And I think that's why they felt comfortable, you know, giving him this big deal at this point. It is, and, and he's going to be back for a long time and try to continue his Giants career. All right, this was a fun one, guys. We'll be back soon as uh, we get kind of, kind of to a football lull. But we'll be back soon and, and, and do one of these, uh, I'm sure, probably before uh, you know next month and then training camp and all that stuff starts up. But, James, as always, I, we appreciate it. You got it, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. And thanks to all of you for listening to episode 94 of Talk is Cheap. Remember to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're there. And, of course, Rollways on NJ.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>